What's up, everybody? Welcome to the show. This week, we're talking more about the balance of the force, the disturbance of the force of the space industry for the Russian Ukraine conflict. We've got SLS that's rolled out, and we talk about what is launch independence and why we're so lucky here in the U.S. to have it. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Today in Space. I am your space science podcast host from the East Coast, Alex Giorfanos. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is Today in in space, the All Things Space Science podcast, and we've got a special one for you this week. We've got a lot to talk about. We've got to talk about uh, everything that's going on in cyber defense world and in in space being used as as a domain for war uh, with the Ukraine and Russia conflict. Uh, there's some interesting development there. More exciting uh, and and in a positive light, uh, we've got the SLS rollout that that rolled out this past week, and it was a glorious, glorious event. NASA Space Launch System uh, for the Artemis 1 wet rehearsal. Uh, it's all getting real. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to talk about a concept called launch independence and what that means. Why that's important for any human venture that's trying to explore the stars and deepen our understanding of meaning and, and exploring the universe. It's something that's has shown itself in the, in the last few months as being absolutely critical to maintaining any kind of space progress. And we'll discuss how that has already been affected globally. Uh, and we're going to discuss the balance of the space industry, the balance of the force. Uh, it it has, uh, there there is a disturbance of the force right now for the space industry. So we're going to get into it. Uh, first, I want to update you guys on everything that's going on. It's been it's been a little bit since our last episode. We had Steve Good, the chief commercial officer of Ramon.space. He came on. We talked about satellites. We talked about um, so many things, his STEM origin stories of math and physics. And we also dove into, you know, what Ramon Space is doing to provide software and supercomputing after launch. So that was a great episode. Go check that out. It's another segment of People of Science. We're hoping to have at least one of those uh, uh, a month, unless we have time for more. So uh, we'll be talking with 12 people this year uh, that'll share their backgrounds in space and uh, or just in science in general, what got them interested in science, technology, engineering, math, the arts, uh, all of those things we, we talk about on those episodes. It's a lot more fun. I get to sit down and just talk to somebody instead of the blank abyss of this uh, this studio <laughs> with nobody in the room with me. <laughs> But you, you and I, we're here and we're talking about space. So this episode has come a little bit later because I just needed more time to think. There's a lot to discuss in this episode and really wanted to wrap my mind around it. So much has changed in a month's time. Last month, you know, we were discussing, we were discussing, you know, an exciting future where, you know, what what happens if we are successful with making hum, humanity multiplanetary and, and discussing, like, what would those people's first 50 years be like? If they're living in space for 50 years, what are they going to experience? What are they going to deal with? What are the technologies that, were, that are going to be obvious in the future that we need to develop now? Those are all exciting future until, obviously, everything that's happened with uh, in Ukraine and we, you know, we send, man all of our support to those people fighting for their freedom. Uh, you know, we just had Greek Independence Day uh, recently. Uh, Zito Elada, the freedom or death, life to Greece, where we stood up after 400 years of tyranny from the Ottomans. We obviously support the Ukrainians in doing the same to, to get their own independence. And a lot has come from that. Uh, there's obviously been, you know, I think one of the only places left for international partnership with Russia right now is really with the the, the space station and the, and the people on board without borders. They're all surviving on one on one station. They they all need to work together to, to get each to get each other home. And we're in this period of this crossover where the missions that are going on are missions that launched before the conflict. So uh we can we might expect change if nothing changes here on the ground with borders um the people that are up there the russians the cosmonauts the astronauts they're all together they're all humans trying to survive uh and it, it's it's a it's one of the great 
impressions that the International Space Station could leave on us in a time like this, which is that that view of, of Earth, the, you know, the borders that we put up are things that we've literally made up. If you look at it from far away, you can't see those borders. So uh, I, it's been really nice to see that. The latest crew that just got up there, they were actually wearing blue and yellow. Uh, and obviously, given the conflict and given that they're cosmonauts, what a what an amazing thing to see. Uh, it turns out that it's actually the co- all three of those cosmonauts all went to school together. Went to the same school. Uh, so they were wearing their school colors, which I'm sure has some connection to Ukrainian backgrounds. So I think that's that's been a really cool thing. As far as the conflict goes, for the beginning here, we'll talk about that in a second. But let's 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 uh, let's split this up a little bit with a little 3D printing action. So uh, with our lab AG3D, we uh, we help bring ideas into reality. You know, this Starship model, early Starship prototype. This was made on our Prusa i3 Mark II. This is a wood filament that's actually stained. So this color that you're seeing is actually the stain of the wood particle filament. And we've done a lot of fun stuff. We have a bunch of stuff that's in our Etsy store. Things that are practical, you know, like if you have a PS4, we have these stands. Where if you want to go vertical, you can put your PS4 on the stand. It lifts it a little bit, allows those fans, allows your system to do exactly what it's supposed to do. Which is pull the air in, cool it it gives it more availability to that air. So we're just priming your system with some really cool looking stuff. This is our multicolor filament for matter hackers. It's quantum filament. It's dichromatic, so there's two different colors, half and half. So we've been playing along with that. Um, We've got things like this that you can help support the podcast. We bring our own ideas into reality for cool products, high quality products to sell to people, to help fund this podcast, to help fund our trips, like the trip we're going to take to Florida this may it seems like uh for the artemis one launch where they're going to launch the 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 first mission and that's going to be an incredible event i want to see (laughs) that rocket on the pad before it launches and in order for us to get there we've got to pay for it so we've got to we got to promote we got to get out there so we're currently trying to get ourselves down to florida so uh you can do that by supporting us a bunch of different ways you can obviously Share the podcast. Get get this podcast out to more people. Because by the time we're there, we're gonna do live streams. We're gonna we're gonna get into it. We're gonna be there. We're gonna be taking a lot of video. A lot of <laughs> we'll see how close we can get to the action. We're gonna meet up with a lot of people, a lot of friends that we're gonna meet up with there. Uh, people that I haven't seen since the CRS nineteen mission, which was December of two thousand nineteen, and a few months later, obviously everything everything went crazy, and we. We're one of the last, I don't think we're the last, but we were one of the last in-person NASA socials. And it would be an absolute awesome time to go see this. Like if we had a whole bunch of people get back together and I, I'm looking at you, <laughs> if you were CRS-19, go, go down to Florida. We're, we're all trying to go. Um, and anybody that wants to go see this mission, this is a, this is a first launch of a lifetime. This is, this is like, the shuttle launching for the first time. This is, this is like what Starship's going to be when it launches the first time. The Saturn V. This is NASA's big rocket, and this starts the mission, the first robotic mission, to go start showing us, getting us more data, proving out that the system can do what it needs to do before we put human beings on board. So then there'll be Artemis II, which they'll actually launch astronauts. They'll do an orbital mission like we did in the early Apollo days, getting ready. And then they're going to attempt the landing. And that will include the starships uh, from SpaceX, which will be the landing system to go from the launched Orion capsule to the surface of the moon. And then we'll see the first woman and next person of color to step on the moon. So that's going to be historic in, in many, many different ways. And that's only the beginning of what's to come with space. So we need to get down there. So ag3d-printing.com <laughs> ag3dprinting.etsy.com that's our, our shop we sell all those cool products there and we've got our James Webb Space Telescope coasters we've got a lot of fun stuff Mandalorian stuff space stuff practical stuff that you can have some fun it doesn't cost you a lot and it helps support us you support us you get a little something cool in return that's how we try to do it here so uh, obviously go check that out recently uh, we'll put up some video because they're not done yet but 
we have finally cracked the code on resin 3D printing. And we started that. We we are going crazy now that we've got it ready. Um, and I'm trying this new plant-based, uh, it says non-toxic, but you still can't touch it with your hands and you can't get it in your eyes and you need to make sure it cures before it goes anywhere. Uh, luckily, it's cured by UV light. So it's nice and easy. It's an MSLA 3D printer. So it's a resin printer and it uses a 4K screen to flash what each layer is going to be it cures the resin and then the top of the printer as opposed to our fff 3d printers that extrude a filament of plastic and build from the bottom up this builds upside down and uses gravity and returns whatever cures back so it's still built in layers like the other stuff but it's built the complete opposite way in fact you know, I, I work in 3D printing during the day. I have a 3D printing business. So it's kind of my everyday. So I have a lot of people I can talk to. If I, if I, just like when I started trying to get into resin 3D printing, I knew a bunch of people I wanted to ask who are much better at that than I am. And there it seems to be like there's definitely a thing that people who do the filament 3D printing, which is a lot cheaper, definitely safer, safer and, and requires less, I would say probably know-how, to get started with this is com it's completely different to, to resin printing almost nothing that i learned from that which is a lot <laughs> i've learned a, i've learned to do a lot of things with that type of 3d printing and as soon as i moved to this other one i was like a baby i was like i didn't know anything so it was <laughs> it was really funny and we wanted to get it ready for some other products that we have going on uh my brother Nick Arfanos over at Weaves and Weights on Instagram and Weaves and Weights podcast. You can check him out uh, if you're into anime, if you're into cosplay, if you're into gaming, if you're into weightlifting. Head over to there. Head over uh, to uh, Weaves and Weights. We've got some stuff that we're getting ready for them for PAX East here in Boston, and we needed to get the resin printer up and running. It turned out it was just easier for us to buy a new 3D printer, and we got a good sale on it, picked it up, put it together, printed like same day it was glorious and we're going to be having a friend on next month oh i shouldn't say his name it'll be a surprise we're going to have some some more 3d printing folks on soon so we can really dive into that because i know some of you have been asking for more of that content we'll bring it we'll bring it so uh it's been busy it's been busy there's been etsy etsy sales uh for the shop which is which is always cool it also means it takes me away from this stuff and Something as complicated as what we're talking about today is like nuanced as, as it is today. It's mixed with uh, politics. It's, mis it's mixed with the loss of life. Like it's, there's a war going on. Um, people are dying. There's, that's, that is a reality and that is a very serious thing to discuss. I don't mean to laugh. I'm just it's a nervous laugh, if anything. But it's mixed with extreme excitement, like the SLS rollout, one of a time thing. We talked about this before, the conundrum of space progress. Every time we start getting amazing progress in space, it seems the world is gone to shit. And I wish the two weren't connected, but it seems like we have a pattern, unfortunately. If you talk to anyone who was alive, especially if they were a kid, when they watched the first moon landing, you can see it in their, their eyes when they bring it up. The How much was behind that landing and what that meant to everybody at that time and how big of an event it was everyone was watching and it really solidified us as humanity again and was able to get us to the point where we had the international space station we were able to we were able to get to this point where we can all work together to push the bounds of space right um the international space station i, I it's literally the only thing it literally the International Space Station is like one of the only things that's keeping the relationships between all these countries still together right now. So um, it meant a lot. And I, I think we could all use a little uh, a little humanity uh, now. So I hope I hope that the, the Artemis One mission and, and all the progress that we're having in space helps us at some point get past everything that that's going on now to, to come back together to look at us as humans living on the same planet and not one border over another you're my enemy i must destroy you right let's let's move away from that we have plenty of that we don't need any more which brings us to 
the next aspect here, which is launch independence. Now, launch independence, launch freedom. The U.S. has a very unique position as a country being able to have so many launch providers and ways of going to space that we do now, including qualified human launch to space. And there are, there are not many, almost, almost none on the planet that can do that other than Russia. And Russia was, with their Soyuz system, basically providing the only ride to space for a decade. It was the only ride for human beings to the International Space Station. Uh, they even took tourists up. I mean, it was literally the only ride. It was reliable because it had been... It had been built in the Cold War. It had uh, had, what, 40 years, 50 years of launching people into space and doing it successfully. So it, it was a system that worked, and we relied on that when we, when we retired the shuttle, when we retired our only ability, the U.S.'s only ability to send humans into space. And then NASA spent the next 10 years redefining everything. They started going, okay, we're going to make the space launch system. We're going to go back to the moon. We need this rocket to be better and bigger than the Saturn V. But it also cannot fail because NASA just came off of an era of only two disasters among so many space shuttle missions. But those two disasters almost ruined NASA as an organization. And NASA is also the best. They're the best of the best. It's also tax-funded. It's 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 not something that can have as much freedom to fail as SpaceX does. And it's a really interesting thought that we're going to dive into. We're going to probably do a whole episode just on how approaching a problem differently can get you to completely different results. And And that's basically what we're seeing is that NASA decided to take a gamble and say, we're going to make the, the real thing we need to do is set up long-term living in space and so they designed the space launch system and they spent i've been talking with so many aerospace engineers and people that worked on the space launch system now that it's rolled out and it's it's a reality we're we're getting prepared for this summer spring summer to launch the world's most powerful rocket and return our ability to go to the moon, to go to another planet, uh, or a moon, regardless, another surface, it's an incredible feat. And it took so many engineers over 10 years across all the different NASA centers to design each individual bolt system. Uh, there were so many people and I'm still only scratching the surface of this as, as I've started to research and, and, and talk to more and more people. It, it was so involved and it had so many limitations that it's, not, it's no wonder that it took this long to accomplish. And, and the good thing is that we, it's here. Like they finally got to the point where they rolled it. They assembled it in the vehicle assembly building. They rolled it out on the mobile launcher and it will launch when that window opens up sometime in May or whenever it is. So it's going to actually get there and it's it's amazing that it actually came together. I, I, I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself because I'm also thinking at the same time as a, an aerospace engineer going to school for this and didn't really have the opportunity to have one of these jobs where I got to work on a piece of this rocket. I, I actually saw the other side of it where the industry had had closed up so much after the shuttle retired. There were so little opportunities, and rightfully so, the best of the best, the people who got the best grades, who had the best connections, they they were the ones that uh got chosen for those for those gigs and there just weren't enough of them. It's a it's a highly special specialized field. And to think what ten years has done to 
to get the space industry to a point where there are space startups everywhere. NASA has a whole list of launch providers from the United Launch Alliance, SpaceX, Rocket Lab, Blue Origin. Um, there's They've got their own rocket with the SLS. They have uh, so many other providers, uh, other companies like Agile Space and uh, Blue Shift uh, Aerospace in Maine. You know, they, you've got all these companies that, and, and that, that's only a few. That's only some of the companies that are out there developing this. We're in such a different place than we were 10 years ago. And so much of this is because of the investment for launch independence. For us to have the freedom to continue a space program, even if the international partnerships fail. Now, that's not a future that anyone was really predicting, other than the Space Force, which we did an episode on this for a while uh, a while ago. The Space Force in there is one of these, we did an episode on it, we covered it in depth, but I'll, I'll give you the, the short of this. But it was called The Future of Space 2060. It was released October of 2019. So this is right around the time where, um, this is right around the time where the Space Force was really created. Everyone was calling it a joke, and they released this. And when I looked at it, it had some really, really great, uh, just like big picture view of what's possible out there. the The best outcome that they talked about was called Star Trek, and uh, one of the worst ones that they <laughs> they mentioned was called Dark Skies, which uh, basically meant that some other country had complete superiority over the skies and the U.S. was unable to, you know, have any kind of dominance in, in space. Um, there's also ones where there's a there's a purely financial uh, gain, but not really scientific exploration. They really went into this and Really, when you look back at this, this is probably one of the only things that could have kind of predicted or, or, or made it so that people could plan for the potential that an international partnership, that the space station would get ripped apart from the Earth and not, you know, get decommissioned first, right? Nope, nobody, nobody saw that happening, especially not as fast as it, as it has started to happen. And until... There is no more Russian presence on the space station. You know, NASA is going to try and keep that up. I mean, it's, it's, we'll, we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens. Um, so, <laughs> with all of that, that is to say that launch independence is so important to space programs. And countries like, uh, countries in Europe, the European Space Agency, has had to, completely reassess its plans for going to space um you know we saw images and video of um baikonur cosmodrome where they were taking down soyuz rockets uh, i believe OneWeb uh literally has a batch of satellites that are locked down in a containment room until launch could happen there again so there's they cannot wait for that to happen, you know. Uh, as we learned in our last episode with Steve Good, you know, the, the business of satellites, the business of launching things into space, there's a, t there's a timeline, and the longer and longer you wait to launch, and the longer it takes, uh, the faster the world moves around you, and it, it's every, you're losing so much money. You're just, you're losing a ton of money in the process of waiting longer than you've planned for. So that's why what Ramon.Space is offering helps people who have satellites and other spacecraft is like you're able to get more and adapt along the way as things change on the ground. And that adaptability, having that um, independence to do so is super important because things on the ground can change so fast as, as we've learned. So things like the Mars sample return mission uh, where the the Mars 2020 rover is helping to begin to start uh, gather soil samples that can then be returned. There was originally a mission that was going to launch a lander and the launcher in the same thing. Um, so they would basically have a lander. It would go grab the samples and then launch it on the same spacecraft. NASA has even gone back to say that 
this dual lander approach needs to get uh, changed again. And that's a mission that's being done with the European Space Agency. You know, everything, I'm sure that this decision to change the approach has come because of the changing waters in the space industry and how now there isn't a Russian partnership in so many of these missions. Um, OneWeb, as we discussed before, UK-based company doing what Starlink is doing for SpaceX, right? A constellation of satellites to provide internet. They are now, and this is the, the wildest thing of, of, of a disturbance in the force, OneWeb is now going to be launching on SpaceX missions. Their legitimate competitor, and because of SpaceX's unique opportunity where they're also a launch provider, in these times where change happens so quick and not being able to launch on another provider, which the only other people they could launch on was a Soyuz, now they are going to be launching on a Falcon 9. And even though they're competitors, they're helping each other out. Like our launch independence has allowed us to not deter our plans because of what someone else has done. Um, and the European Space Agency is now shifting all of its priorities. It's it's uh, I learned this by listening to Terry Vert's podcast, uh, which is very good at down to earth. Very, very good podcast. Um, and he had a great, great review of just like everything going on with Russia. And I learned a lot, you know, especially that. You know, with with uh, Europe, they're decommissioning their Ariane 5 rocket. And the Ariane 5 is what brought the James Webb Space Telescope uh, to Lagrange Point 2. The Ariane 5 is getting decommissioned and brought down so that Ariane 6 can be built. And so, you know, it's not the it's not the first time this has happened. You know, these types of things, there was the Delta 4, now there's the Delta 5 for the United Launch Alliance. Having different revisions of rockets makes sense especially if you're going to cut down on the cost, maybe provide some more performance to bring certain other rockets into uh, certain other payloads into special orbits that aren't reachable by anyone else in the market. Those type of things happen. It's just the timing of everything, right? So there's going to be a huge shifting of the board where even if things get resolved with Ukraine and Russia and we're able to get to some kind of semblance of international partnership again there's already damage done there's already delays and partnerships in scientific research in space development that's not being done with the russian people because of this so it's it the the there's already been damage and we just hope that there can be some kind of end independence for ukraine and then a uh, a return to cooperative international partnerships the world is crazy so who knows and space progress continues so if we take the trend that we've been learning of the space conundrum uh you know unfortunately it, it won't be unexpected that there's going to be craziness in the world so why are we so lucky let's close out with this why are we so lucky as uh, americans to have launch independence did it just happen uh, by chance? Are, are, are we just, are, are, you know, did, did it just fall in our laps? No. This podcast was built on discussing that story of us getting back to the place where we had launch independence. Again, I uh, went to school for aerospace engineering at Worcester Polytechnic Institute, and I uh, got my degree in aerospace engineering and a concentration in astronautics and a uh, minor in jazz performance. But when I went to school at that time, you know, the shuttle got retired my junior year of college. And it was a bleak, bleak output. And there was this, you know, we were all scared. We were all scared after the space shuttle got retired and everything that came from the space shuttle and, the, and what failure actually means. You know, it, it scared a whole generation into the most stringent tests with no real avenue or money or incentive to develop new technologies it was just use the stuff that's flown before build your spacecraft from that and you know we might tweak it we might make it a little more efficient but that's what you use and so, as you could probably tell someone like myself that that did that was very very disconcerting and obviously the people that work at spacex all of them are there for that exact same reason they're going to 
bust their ass and work 60 hour weeks it's probably light live at work basically dedicate their whole lives to this because it requires that much of them the reason they're doing that is because they wanted something that was extraordinary and every day was extremely exciting and you were doing something new and pushing the bounds of what's possible and now to see what SpaceX has done and what, what they've helped us do to achieve this launch of dependence, they're not the only ones, but they've played a major part in it, and spe- especially America's ability to bring humans into space. That That is SpaceX. They, they won that race. They're the ones. But how, do, but how do we get here? Why are we here? I think if you go back to President Obama, and NASA Administrator Charles Bolden. It's their partnership working together to get launch contractors, get the commercial space program working to, you know, we have to pay the Russians uh, so many millions of dollars per astronaut per seat when, you know, these were built 40 years ago, 30 years ago. You know, they're sitting, you know, they're getting taken care of, but they're, it's old technology, right? We're paying millions of dollars just to send an astronaut up uh, and and not even having the ability to actually launch into space. Um, President Obama and Charles Bolden put up the commercial crew program that made it so that these these companies could push the bounds, could fail and get paid to keep failing until they figured it out. Um, That helped NASA focus on the big picture. You know, NASA had never had to do this before. We never had to create this like, whole network of redundancies to allow for human space travel to be a thing that was not something that nasa has ever done before you know we've done missions with lots of redundancies and 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 spacecraft with lots of redundancies but never like the whole the whole thing of space travel just hasn't been done and then the interest in space died and so you can't get a lot of funding so what do you do how do you do all of these things with the little amount of money that was actually being uh, coordinated to the effort. We're talking uh, an effort probably larger than it took to go to the moon the first time. And that had the motivation of war behind it. And in 2010, 2011, 2012, that that wasn't, that, there was no way. You'd get laughed at. you get laughed at if you said that, you know, space needed uh, more money or more funding or anything like that. People, people were saying, does NASA even exist? That was what it was like a decade ago. Um, From there, Jim Bridenstine, as the administrator of NASA after Charles Bolden, he took the reins and really fought a lot of the political battles that needed to happen, just like James Webb did for us. Um, He really did a good job of keeping NASA NASA, not politicizing NASA, but being a great politician to make sure that the funding that needed to be there happened and he was there to massage that awkward period where you know we we had we weren't even sure what sls was going to be we were still talking about having a hodgepodge of like united launch alliance uh uh, second stage having the orion capsule having a falcon heavy first stage like we were talking about some crazy stuff um not that long ago and and you know sls was was being worked on, but it was kind of like in, in the mix. Um, on top of that, you know, we had all these other companies that were also building up. The small satellite market was booming. Rocket Lab was picking, picking that up. Blue Origin was behind the curtain most of that time. Now the people at NASA knew what they were doing, um, cause they were getting funded by them. And obviously they were literally posted up right next door, um, to, You know, they're right in that Kennedy Space Center area. Uh, SpaceX obviously was doing their thing, and the United Launch Alliance was was keeping steady with all the missions that they have going on. You know, they're a very, very large organization. They have a huge stake in the launch market uh, around the world, not even just the U.S. Um, And then we also got lucky that when SpaceX started to show promise in the race towards sending the first humans to the International Space Station, the first American astronauts from American soil on American spacecraft. When SpaceX did that, and just a little before that, we were commenting it on the podcast. It's one of the cool things about this podcast, how we do it. Like You can kind of go back and see what the 
what the feeling was then, what 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 we thought was the case back then, and and the things that we were looking at. There was this point. I think it was right around the abort test where it just seemed like all the pieces were coming together, and and. NASA and SpaceX had found this balance after a decade of just angst between the young uh, space people at uh, at places like SpaceX and you know the the traditional um, flight heritage only uh, flight heritage heavy uh, old space industry and you know no, you know we just we do what we do we don't need to you know innovating is not the thing we're doing we're trying to we're trying to run an industry here um <laughs> sorry so we those two those two found a way or 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 it dissipated right the the actual people behind the scenes got together and talked nasa saw their progress they were able to see the data and see the testing they were doing i'm sure spacex learned a lot from nasa in that process as well and we found balance and that was a huge huge thing because it allowed us to achieve this launch independence that now you 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 read a lot of these articles or a lot of stuff we talk about you see a lot on space twitter right now people are talking about how you know oh the US's space industry is is booming it's it's more powerful than it ever was we are so lucky that that's the case that the timing worked out that there was people like President Obama and, and uh, NASA Administrator Charles Bolden in the early days who fought for this and made this happen. Jim Bridenstine for fighting all those political battles, and now, you know, he's retired like the like the hobbits at the end of uh, Lord of the Rings. He's gone, he's gone into the other the other realm, um, the realm of elves, to live out the rest of his life because <laughs> he's too dramatized by the by Middle Earth, the Middle Earth of space politics. Uh, so we, we thank all those people, all the early pioneers of companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin that, that got both those companies to a place where now either they've stayed to continue their mission or they've left to start some other space startup. Uh, there's such a trickle down of this investment in the space industry that has truly made the U.S. launch independence possible and as strong as it is today. That was from back then in those early days and all the work that it took throughout then to get to this point to invest in us, to invest in the U.S.'s ability to have our own space program. And that provides the ability for others to to have it as well. But if everything goes the wrong way, we still have our ability to go to space. And that's what I'll leave you with this week. We went long this week, but there was a lot to talk about. Um, Thank you for joining us. Uh, This is Today in Space. Uh, Don't forget... The SLS is on the pad. It's it's on the rollout. It's at the wet rehearsal. That means launch is soon. So in order to help us get down there to do live coverage, to take lots of pictures and videos, to get you guys up close and personal, although I definitely highly, highly recommend if you can get down there, get down there. But in order to get us there, you have to help us out. Share the podcast. Um, subscribe to the podcast. Apple Podcasts. Spotify. Uh, YouTube, hit that hit that subscribe button, hit that bell to get notified, share this around, get more people talking, get more people watching. You can also support us financially by getting something awesome 3D printed from our store, ag3dprinting.etsy.com. That is our shop. We've got a bunch of stuff. Our James Webb Space Telescope coaster. We've got our Mandalorian magnets for your fridge. We have our ps4 stand vertical and horizontal to keep your gaming going and so much more and then of course if you have a project if you're into 3d printing or you're just getting into 3d printing maybe you want to do something for a job for a project for something at school something for yourself you've heard about it you don't know what to do hit us up we'll give you a free quote on your project whether you have a model already whether it's just a drawing on a piece of paper or just an idea We help you bring that idea into reality with 3D printing. It's one of our specialties. Uh, I've been designing in CAD for like over 10 years at this point. And finding 3D printing just helped me uh, do that faster. So so now we help you do that as well. It's one of the magic of this show uh, and this podcast and and what we do in our 3D printing lab, AG3D. You can follow us at AG3D Printing on Instagram. See all the amazing stuff we're doing. We're going to have a lot more resin 3D printing and a lot of cool stuff coming up. And of course, 
more 3D printing with this dichromatic quantum filament from Matter Hackers. We are uh, not sponsored, but we could be. We could be. But we're going to keep showing you what's possible with 3D printing because that's what we do here. Um, thank you for joining us. Thank you for listening. Thank you for watching. Be good. Spread love and spread science. Live long and prosper. We'll see you on the next episode of Today in Space.